Good morning. There is so, I'm so delighted to see so many of you, and there is so much energy that I feel in the room that I would like us to share it. So let me start with, good morning. Good morning. Ah, it feels good. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, for, for your kind introduction and for your charge to us here today. I need to say uh, your personal commitment to making MIT more diverse and inclusive has inspired people across the Institute to take these issues at heart and to keep looking for practical solutions. I personally thank you for your leadership. Ed. I want to also thank your co-chair, Deb Hodges Pavon. Deb, are you there? Yes. Uh, and the entire Institute Summit Planning Committee for creating this first class event. And I also want to express my sincere gratitude to the groups that are co-sponsoring this event with my office. That's the Committee on Race and Diversity and the Council on Staff Diversity and Inclusion led by Alice Johnson, whom I saw earlier this morning. Alice, there we are. I also want to thank so many of you for coming today. Ed mentioned the tremendous jump in summit attendance this year. This is indeed very good news. The issues we are here to discuss affect everyone in the MIT community, directly or indirectly. And I believe they require thoughtful attention from us all. The title of today's summit presents us with two important MIT values, meritocracy and inclusion. As with most human values, it suggests that there is probably a gap between our principles and our practices. And MIT is a place that prides itself in solving problems. So that gap itself challenges us to consider what we could do differently. How can we come closer to our ideal, to our aspiration? To frame today's conversation, I want to begin with a brief personal perspective. Not because my own story is special or important, but because it is quite common. And it helps to show why meritocracy has been such an attractive ideal for our community. At MIT, meritocracy has been a core value for a long time. <clears throat> and it is a natural fit with MIT standards of integrity and excellence. From the beginning, MIT saw itself as a place where people with talent, drive, and good ideas could succeed regardless of their background. Throughout its history, that core value has served MIT very well. When I joined MIT, when I came to interview for a faculty position first, that commitment to meritocracy made MIT an incredibly welcoming place for someone like me. And I will tell you that I was surprised. I had grown up in South America, the same time zone as Cambridge, but culturally a million miles away. Uh, my immigrant parents had neither means nor connections. My brothers and I were the first generation in our family to go to college, let alone grad school. And at the time, even when I came to MIT, I was still learning and struggling to be comfortable with English. For all these reasons, coming to Cambridge, I expected to feel like an outsider. But when I got to MIT, it did, to me, feel like home. There was a place for me. There seemed to be a place for people of many backgrounds, and MIT radiated a spirit of openness, fairness, and decency. And I had never seen anything like it. Let me repeat that. I had never seen anything like it. At the time, <clears throat> from my limited point of view, MIT felt like a true meritocracy, and that feeling made me want to come here and stay. Today, after three decades at MIT, I still believe that this institution is remarkably good at welcoming talent from everywhere. 
but I have listened to and learned from those with different experiences and different backgrounds. And I have come to understand that the meritocracy story is not that simple. I know that I might have felt very different and not so much at home if I had been gay or African-American or a woman. I realized that saying that meritocracy is our ideal implies that we can all agree on what constitutes merit. That also not that simple. And as we learned from the 1999 report on women in science, and in the 2010 report of the Initiative on Faculty, Race, and Diversity, it is also clear that believing in the principle of meritocracy does not give us permission to believe that we are perfectly objective and fair. In fact, as we will hear this morning, it turns out that thinking of ourselves as a meritocracy may even have counterintuitive negative effects. So meritocracy turns out to be complicated. And I hope we can begin to explore many of those complications in this morning's panel. As I said in my inaugural address, I hope that through doing this kind of work together, we can put MIT on a path towards transformative change. The desire is there. The commitment is there but it has to be a two-way commitment. As I said then, my dream is that by the time MIT selects its 18th president, our diversity will no longer need to be a mother of presidential declarations because it will be a welcome, obvious reality and a vital source of MIT's creative strength. Let's work together towards that goal for the benefit of MIT, and for the benefit of our society. Let me finish by stating the obvious. There is plenty of work to do to get us there. So please, let's get moving. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is now my pleasure, thank you, to introduce our facilitator for this morning's panel, the T.T. and Wei Fong Chao Professor of Asian Civilizations, Emma Tang. Professor Tang, who's going to join me in a moment, I want to embarrass her in front of you, so, so come here, Emma. I, I want to see your face when I read these things. <laughs> so, <laughs> Professor <laughs> Tang. <laughs> Professor Teng is an accomplished scholar of Chinese and East Asian culture, Asian American history, and women's and gender studies. She has also provided extraordinary leadership in our diversity efforts at MIT. She co-chaired the Committee on Race and Diversity. She pioneered several new multicultural minors in the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. And she advised MIT's general counsel in drafting a friend of the court brief on the legal case Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin, currently before the U.S. Supreme Court. So please join me in welcoming Professor Emma Tang. much, um, Professor, um, President Wright, for a very embarrassing introduction. I wasn't warned that that was going to occur, but thank you very much, uh, both President Wright and Professor Bershinger, for very eloquent and moving opening remarks that have really set the tone for today. As Professor Bershinger noted in his opening remarks, last year's summit was um, dedicated to examining the tension between diversity and excellence, which had been identified as a source of concern for our community. And in opening a dialogue concerning this tension, we ultimately affirmed that yes, diversity and excellence can, and in fact do, go hand in hand. And that partnership 
supports the core mission of the Institute. But what also emerged from the discussion and the feedback from last year's summit was the need for a closer examination of excellence itself. How do we define and assess excellence? And who gets to define it? Is everyone in our community given the full chance to demonstrate his or her excellence? In short, it became apparent that there is a need for a deeper understanding of the concept of meritocracy. Meritocracy is an idea with a long history at MIT, as we have just heard from our current president. And as the 16th president, Susan Hockfield, stated in her Lowell lecture in February 2012 concerning the founding of MIT, in its thoroughness, intensity, and conviction, William Barton Rogers MIT had no peer. He endowed us with values that still guide us today. Useful work founded on science, hands-on learning, meritocracy, hard work, and service. So there is no doubt that many of us embrace MIT, um, the MIT ideal of meritocracy. And yet, as Professor Bershinger noted, obstacles exist to achieving true meritocracy. In addition, we must pause to ask how many of us really understand the complexities of meritocracy, the principles and the practices. Our panel this morning is dedicated to examining precisely this question. What are the principles of meritocracy? Is meritocracy a system that provides equal opportunity for all? Is it a powerful mechanism for upward mobility in a society that is beset by inequality? An inequality that economists have noted is now at its highest level since before the Depression. Or are there, in fact, pitfalls or paradoxes in the practice of meritocracy that reinforce bias and intensify those inequalities? What does the empirical research literature tell us? We are very fortunate here at MIT to have some of the leading researchers on fundamental questions concerning meritocracy in the workplace. And we will hear from two of those top researchers this morning. But the research literature only tells us one part of the story. Many people are also eager to hear the answer to a perhaps more fundamental question, does MIT practice what it preaches? To articulate the principles of meritocracy and inclusion is one thing, but how do we carry it out in practice? Again, we are very lucky to have with us here this morning an individual who will, has played and will continue to play a leading role relating to the practice of meritocracy and inclusion here at MIT. One thing I would like to emphasize as we begin this morning's activities is that people define meritocracy in different ways. And we are going to see this diversity of definition, starting with our panel this morning, and then throughout the day with the student film, the workshops, and no doubt in our conversations with one another. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce the distinguished panelists joining President Reif this morning, Emilio Castilla, Associate Professor of Management at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Professor Denise Lewin Lloyd, Associate Professor of Management, also MIT Sloan School of Management. And Stuart Schmill, Dean of Admissions at MIT. In addition, I'm very sorry to say that Mariana Pierce Director of Policy, Compliance, and Labor Relations at MIT, who was originally scheduled to be on our panel this morning, unfortunately came down with the flu. And she is very regretful she will not be able to join our panel this morning. Now, that being the case, we very much recognize that staff comprise a large part of our audience here today. And we are regretful that we don't have staff uh, perspectives represented on the panel. Therefore, Alice Johnson has very generously offered to answer any questions during the Q&A session after the panel that might relate to staff perspectives in particular. 
So please join me in welcoming our panelists this morning. The order of presentation will be Professor Castilla, Professor Lloyd, and then Dean Schmill. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. I've been actually looking forward to uh, this panel and this uh, diversity summit, not only because it's really great to um, spend time with our president and also other colleagues from MIT, but also because I'm excited about um, us telling, uh, telling you about our research and also about I'm excited about the discussions that we're going to be having the entire day today. Like our president, MIT welcomed me also many years ago. And actually, your story, your personal story, President, also reminded me of my own personal story. And I think it, reminding us, it reminded us all of our own personal story, right? Especially it reminded us of a story of how talent, effort, hard work, and the many opportunities that we've been given took us all to this place, to this wonderful place that we call MIT today. And as our president told us in his inaugural speech, we are all very proud to belong to MIT. We're very proud to belong to a meritocratic place, to a place that welcomes talent from everywhere, where, welcome, uh, where, where it radiates the spirit of openness, fairness, and diversity. In the very few minutes that I have today, I'm actually going to tell you and share some of my own research that illustrates how achieving meritocracy is actually harder than it seems to be. In other words, the principle of meritocracy is something that we shouldn't be taking for granted, and you're going to see why. Especially, I'm going to be telling you about the critical challenges that organizations, institutions, and leaders are facing, especially when they're undertaking meritocratic efforts inside of their organizations. For those of you who do not know me yet, I'm a faculty member at the Sloan School, and for many years I've been obsessing about studying the social aspects of work and employment inside of organizations. In particular, given the widely popular goals of promoting meritocracy and opportunity inside of the organizations, I've been investigating the role of merit and merit-based practices in shaping the careers of employees and individuals over time. And today, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my research, right? So let me tell you about the rise of meritocracy inside of organizations. And I don't know if you can hear me. So we do know uh, that organizations are increasingly adopting practices that are trying to really measure merit and link merit with outcomes and rewards that employees achieve. Just to give you an idea of some of these numbers, already in 2005, we knew that many corporations in the United States we're actually using practices that evaluate merit or performance and try to allocate rewards and outcomes, employee outcomes, based on the performance of the employees. The same thing about manuals and consultants that they're going around the world giving consulting to firms. They're actually promoting that introducing some of these merit-based practices actually may increase the productivity of employees. They also may increase this kind of feeling, this kind of belief that working in a place that rewards, uh, that rewards us for our performance ultimately is going to help us really achieve great outcomes inside of the organization. And actually, as a matter of fact, some of my colleagues are actually even thinking that some of these practices are actually creating this illusion of opportunity, right? Who doesn't want to work for an institution that actually puts a lot of emphasis in opportunity, puts a lot of emphasis in fairness? That's the type of institutions we would like to work for, right? Today, I'm not going to be talking about some of this, I'm actually going to be talking more about my research, especially because when I started working on this, I wanted to pay attention to the implications, the racial and gender implications of adopting some of these practices in the workplace. Right? In particular, I was very, very concerned in answering the following question. Could it be that some of these practices are actually improving equity, are improving fairness, are improving diversity inside of the organizations? 
right? The other way of looking at this question is a much more pessimistic question, which is, could it be some of, that some of these practices, some of these merit-based efforts, are actually introducing bias in the workplace? And this is what I'm gonna try to show you today, right? So I'm gonna start with a very simple illustration of what we mean by the meritocratic claim. And I think that today we're gonna to be talking about the different dimensions of what we mean by merit and the different ways of trying to really adopt meritocratic efforts inside of organizations. But I'm gonna show you a very simple one, right? In theory, and this is the only uh, equations that I'm gonna be putting today, I promise you. <laughs> so imagine that in an organization, we're actually able to rank all our employees from one to five every year, right? And supposedly, this performance evaluation actually measures the merit and the talent of these employees. And then assume that we're also gonna try to really be very meritocratic, and we're gonna try to distribute some important outcome like a merit-based salary increase depending on your level of performance, right? So one will imagine that regardless of, for example, the gender of the employee, the same amount of increase for the same level of performance should be equal, right? So if number one means very poor performance, you will imagine that men and women performing at the low level should be getting the same level of salary increase, perhaps zero. As we go down, the performance of the employee as it's being measured by the process increases, so that at five, if the performance is outstanding, you, should, you, you know, the, the, the reward should be equal regardless of gender, race, nationality, or any other characteristics that are completely unrelated to performance, right? So this is one of the things that I found when I actually started studying one organization in the year 2000, right? So you can see clearly that this organization really were, they were actually ranking their employees from one to five. And you can clearly see that the higher your performance, the higher the merit-based bonus at the end of the year, right? But here you see already a pattern, right? There is this difference between men and women in the amount of merit-based increase that they receive. By the way, the same could apply to being hired, being terminated, uh, promotions, right? Any other outcome that we care about in the workplace, right? But of course, this is a very simple table, right? Based on this table, there are many other factors that could actually ex be explaining why there are these gender differences, right? It could be that this table is ignoring the fact that maybe some of these employees stay in the organization longer than others, so it's a longitudinal process. It could be that there are many other excess, there are many other characteristics, many other factors that um, uh, depend on the employee that could be affecting why there are these differences in salaries, right? It could be the type of job, it could be the type of division, it could be the type, um, the type of manager that they're actually interacting with. There are many other complicating factors, right? And this is what brought me inside of an organization where I was actually able to really examine these merit-based increases, controlling for all the factors that could be accounting for such salary increase differences by gender, race, or nationality, right? And this organization is, again, very, pro -typic very typical of an organization that is trying to evaluate merit and trying to link this merit with the pay or outcome variables, right? And in this particular organization, when I started studying it, there was no evidence that there were gender or racial uh, differences in the starting salary, right? So once the employee starts working for the organization, there was actually not differences significant at all. But one of the things that I realized is that performance was actually the most important predictor of these salary increases over time. Having said that, I also found evidence of what I call the performance reward bias. That even if we assumed that we're not biased in the way we're evaluating merit inside of the organizations, still there was an additional layer of discretion introduced in the system where women and minorities who are actually doing the same job, working for the same unit, working for the same supervisor and when the same human capital characteristics still were getting a lower salary increase even when we were controlling for the level of performance in, in, in the models, right? And what, what, this, what this meant, or what to me, was that this was actually introducing an interesting research question, right? Could it be that actually introducing this merit-based practice of rewarding the performance of employees over time based on their merit 
Could it be that it actually introduces biases inside of the organizations? So I'm going to tell you in the rest of my presentation today, I'm going to tell you about an experiment that was actually really meant to study this. Right? This is what we call, uh, Steve and I, the paradox of meritocracy. Could it be that actually organizational efforts to promote meritocracy in the workplace introduces or unleashes biases when we actually make decisions that have to do with the compensation, promotion, hiring decisions of employees of different race, gender, et cetera. And our hypothesis, even when it may seem very counter counterintuitive, was the following. We actually thought that managers who are actually embedded in organizations that emphasize meritocracy may actually express or show greater bias against women, for example, uh, than managers that are not embedded in organizations that emphasize meritocracy. This is very counterintuitive, but this finding, and I'll come back to it later today, it's very consistent with work in organizational theory that has to do with this idea that organizations adopt practices, adopt uh, procedures, just because everybody's doing it. It's the right thing. It seems to be the right thing to do, but they don't pay attention too much to the design and the implementation aspects of it, of it to ensure that it works. And the same idea about research that shows that cultures, that values, that principles that we may have in our minds actually can unleash stereotypes and biases over time, right? So we run uh, time. We run a, a set of, I'm going to have to go really fast. <laughs> wow, I'm really bad at timing. And yes. Um, so I run, we run a set of experiments. And really quickly, I'm going to tell you that those two were, two were important dimensions here. Uh, imagine that half of this room, right, we actually assign you to a company that places a lot of value in meritocracy, right? And half of the other room, randomly, are placed into an organization that we do not mention meritocracy or merit at all. And then you all evaluate the same type of employees, but there are two employees who are the test employees. The only difference that they have is the gender. They're performing at the same level, right? So here, you know, we actually did this with real participants, with participants that actually not only have managerial experience, experience, but they love being managers. They love supervising people, right? And this is what we found, right? We ask you to now distribute a performance reward bonus uh, between these two equivalent employees in their performance, right? For those of you who were assigned to the non-meritocratic condition, you gave a higher bonus to women than men equally performing women and men. But for those of you who are assigned to the condition where we put emphasis in meritocracy, the pattern completely reversed, right? Uh, we actually gave a higher bonus to men than women at the same level of performance, right? And these are employees uh, that the participants didn't meet, and they were actually making uh, decisions on their behalf. So I'm just going to wrap up here just to remind you, and again, a very limited time to really tell you a lot of, about a lot of research that I've been doing on this, but that, that just to remind us about the critical challenges that employers, that organizations, that leaders face when they're actually undertaking meritocratic efforts. As you've seen, putting a lot of emphasis on meritocracy can actually increase our confidence that our judgments are impartial and unbiased, leading to more bias when it comes to making decisions. So therefore, uh, it's a warning, right, that meritocracy may be more difficult to achieve than we really think it is. And I want to emphasize that my presentation, I wouldn't like it to be used as a way of me telling you that we shouldn't be adopting merit-based practices at all, but rather that we need to really pay attention to these uh, effects, the this, uh, these effects, these unintended consequences of the time. And some of the research that I've been doing uh, recently has to do with how to help employers, how to help organizations to better design some of these practices, how to encourage them to make sure that these programs, these procedures, accomplish the goals that they want to accomplish. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted, as all have said so far, to be here today to continue our conversation about meritocracy and inclusion. 
My colleague, Professor Castilla, just talked with you about how paradoxically, promoting an institution as a meritocracy can actually have unintended consequences of increased bias. I would like to continue this conversation by talking about the challenge of meritocracy from the perspective of those who are in the minority within organizations. When the targets of discrimination become the decision makers in the decision making process, they may also have some concerns that impact the evaluation process in a negative way and increase bias. This is what I think about as the other side of the coin. So I'll share with you some results from the survey I conducted that hints at the prevalence of this problem and also suggests that inclusion may be part of the solution to the situation. So part of what Professor Castilla did not really get into or was not able to talk about in his you know, limited time is what are the underlying mechanisms of this bias? And I think when we think about biases, we often consider discrimination, right? The idea that negative stereotypes that we have about groups and then apply to individual members of those groups will keep us from recognizing talent and promoting people who are otherwise deserving. So for example, the idea that women are not competent in math and science, or that white men can't jump, <laughs> or that men are not particularly nurturing may inhibit us from hiring female math professors, white basketball players, or men to be workers in daycare situations. Now, this is something that I think we're very familiar with. And one approach that we've taken, I say solution, but I use that you know, very loosely, but one action that we've taken to help alleviate this is to diversify the decision makers, right? So part of the issue is that, well, these individuals have not been part of the process, and so if we make them part of the process, then they can help alleviate these issues. So we move from juries that look like this to juries that look like this. More diverse, women are represented, people of color are represented. And this doesn't happen just in jury pools, right? This is happening across all types of organizations, boards of directors, and in our own institutions, hiring and promotion committees, where really, when we are evaluating candidates who are diverse, we want to have some of that diversity represented in the pool of decision makers as well. So if we're evaluating a female candidate, we definitely would like to have at least one female representative as part of the decision-making process. And when that happens, the process seems more fair, right? And maybe the decisions may even be seen as more legitimate. So somehow in this process, as the African-American juror, you're going to help shed some doubt maybe on the black defendant's guilt. Or as the female evaluator, you're going to help convince others that this female candidate actually is a good way to go. Well, if this sounds like a tall order, then you might be getting a sense, a little bit of the sense of where I'm headed. Here's something that we may not be considering. Now imagine yourself as part of this group in particular. Imagine yourself as this individual. Or perhaps you don't have to imagine yourself in this situation at all. Perhaps you've been in this situation many times. Maybe in your work group or in your department, you stand out because of your race or gender. Maybe you feel different because of your sexual orientation, or maybe it's your religion, maybe it's your nationality, or maybe you're the only Republican in a sea of Democrats. <laughs> or maybe you're the only Yankee fan in a sea of Red Sox fans. <laughs> Whatever the case may be, when you feel like the different person and you are in the position of evaluating someone who's similar to you, it might feel like that situation comes with a lot of baggage. So if we think about our female candidate here, there are many things that we want from her. We want her to be neutral, right? We recognize that part of the value she adds is that she is someone who's been the target of discrimination. She understands the negative stereotypes against women, and we want her to counterbalance that by recognizing that those stereotypes don't apply to all women, and so really you can just look at this candidate not as a woman per se, but with their merits, right? Just look at their qualifications. That's the ideal of the meritocracy. On the other hand, we actually want her to advocate, right? She understands the negative stereotypes against women, 
she understands that these negative stereotypes may be part of this process. And so we want her to counteract those negative stereotypes by helping to promote this individual. So the challenge here is when you promote this individual through advocacy, is that going to be seen as a legitimate process? The two sides of the coin are that as a target of discrimination, this individual is worried, excuse me, about being, uh, having the negative stereotypes assessed to her and that hindering her ability to perform. But as the decision maker, she's afraid that if she's advocating for someone that's similar, that will also not be seen as legitimate. And I call this idea that you're concerned that your advocacy for the similar candidate is not going to be seen as legitimate favoritism threat. She's afraid of the idea that she will be seen as playing favorites. Now, frankly, uh, part of the reason that I had this idea and I'm interested in this research is because I've been in this position. I've been in this position as a PhD student, as part of the admissions process. I've been in this position as a faculty member when someone has approached me to ask you know, my perspective on the minority candidate who just gave a job talk. And perhaps you've been in this position as well. well. Like any good academic that gets into a situation and starts to wonder, am I the only one that's feeling this? Am I the only one that's thinking this? I did a survey. So I had a group of African American professionals. And I asked them to imagine themselves in a situation like this. And you can imagine yourself in a situation like this as well, using whatever characteristic might be salient for you. You're part of a five-person hiring committee, and you're the only racial or ethnic minority on the team, or fill in the blank for yourself. You now have a short list of five, six candidates, and you're going to meet with a group and make one offer. So you're going to be meeting shortly to have a discussion and decide who's going to get this offer. All of the candidates seem qualified and have differing strengths and weaknesses. That's not unusual. One candidate also shares your race or ethnicity, and that candidate is your first choice. So would you please tell me what thoughts are going through your head as you anticipate discussing your evaluation of your top choice with your group members? So they free form response answered the question, and then after they answered the question, I coded the responses. In other words, I categorized them into the categories that we've been discussing today. First is neutrality, so where there's no mention of race, they mention the candidate's qualifications, their strengths. You know, this is what I'm thinking about as I'm going to go into this meeting, right? What are they good at? How am I going to tell that to my colleagues? The second condition was advocacy. So the idea that I really do want to promote this person, and an example of a response in the advocacy category is, I want to push this individual through due to the lack of African American professionals in corporate America. And the final category is favoritism threat. So this concern about appearing favorably biased to someone as a result of your race. So an example of this is, will my team members only think I'm advocating for the candidate due to race? And after the categories were made, I looked at the percent of people that responded in each of the categories. With respect to neutrality, about a third of the responses were in that category as neutral, not mentioning race at all, just talking about qualifications. Advocacy, I think, you know, implicitly one of our goals, didn't fare so well. So only about 11% of the respondents said things that suggested they were actively going to try to advocate for the individual as a result of their race. And if you're good at math, then you know that, unfortunately, Favoritism threat was the largest percentage. Not only was it the largest, more than half of the individuals who spontaneously responded wrote that these are some of the concerns that they were you know, thinking about as they were going into the situation. Now, I can't talk about right now, but maybe we'll come up a little bit in our Q&A, sort of the outcomes of this. So I can say for myself when I'm in this situation, I do start to question you know, what exactly am I going to say? How much will I support? How much will I advocate? And in some work that I've done, I've seen that women who are in this position, when they're the only one in the group, will actually evaluate a female candidate who's equally qualified as a male candidate lower than that male candidate. And I think that it's in part out of these concerns about this advocacy. So, what should we do? Well. 
like Professor Castilla, many of us who study diversity issues related to diversity are not going to stand up in front of you and tell us that we should not increase the diversity of decision makers. That is not the answer. I think that's a very important element and perhaps a necessary but insufficient step. It's important to have diversity in the decision-making population because with more diversity, we both have individuals who don't feel that they stand out as much on the characteristic and also help by showing others that some of the negative stereotypes they may hold may not always be true. But diversity is not enough. And I suggest that inclusion really may be more of the solution. When we include individuals and we make them feel that they are part of this institution and part of you know, the ethos, and we can really individuate them rather than having them just represent a particular category, then I think we can begin to alleviate some of the concerns that may be held. So that is all the time I have to share with you today. I'd like to thank you for your time and turn the podium over to my colleague, Stu Schmiel, to talk about. <laughs> Well, on that uplifting note, um, I'm going to talk about the practice of admissions here, in particular undergraduate admissions, in the context of meritocracy and inclusion and how we practice it. And also, we'll have some comments um, in light of uh, the research that you saw here from Emilio and uh, Denise. So first of all, how? Do we make our admissions decisions? I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed, um, because we don't actually use uh, the magic eight ball, except in really tough cases. <laughs> but what we do uh, when we think about admitting a class of students to MIT every year is we go back to the mission statement of MIT. Everything we do flows from the MIT mission, as uh, everything I imagine uh, that happens at MIT ought to. And so we uh, take our guidance from this. We think about rigorous academic study and the fact that a diverse campus community is critical uh, for the education that all of our students get. So uh, for the undergraduate education program, we want to be developing uh, students who are going to go out and be able to lead in this global interconnected world that we have. And so we think about developing both technical and personal skills. And the only way we can really do that effectively for all of our students is to build a talented and diverse student body. So that's really what we think of as our charge. So let me talk about that uh, in the context of meritocracy and inclusion. First of all, meritocracy. As has been mentioned, we don't use a single unidimensional notion of merit. Uh, it's very hard to do that. So how would we do that? Is it SAT scores? Is it math ability? Is it artistic ability or music talent? Um, in fact, last spring, we did a survey of the MIT faculty and asked them what qualities that they valued in students. And you might be surprised to learn that there was a diversity of opinion. <laughs> and in fact, quite a bit of, of uh, contradiction. Some faculty wanting certain qualities and others wanting the exact opposite. So merit is a multi-dimensional thing. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. What we mean by inclusion is active. So we actively spend uh, quite a bit of resources in building our applicant pool so that we reach out to groups that otherwise would be underrepresented. In, in just, if, we did, if we did no outreach, there are certain groups who would be underrepresented in our applicant pool. Uh, these are students from low-income backgrounds, women, uh, minority students, rural students. So we actually go out to build our applicant pool. Let me shed, shed a little bit more light on how uh, the applicant pool and we make our admissions decisions actually works. Okay. Um, 
Imagine this is our applicant pool. And every uh, person up on the screen there represents about 1,000 applications. This year, we have about 19,000 applications. Okay. So out of that 19,000, about 15,000 of them are qualified academically to do the work here. And they would be absolutely fine. If they came here, they would uh, graduate on time and do great. Out of that 15,000, about 9,000 of them are, uh, are so excellent that they, if they were here on campus, uh, they would seem like any other uh, excellent MIT student. That's how, good, that's how deep and strong our applicant pool is. We can pick amongst 9,000 students, all of whom would be absolutely outstanding students for MIT. And so it is out of that group of 9,000 that we assemble the class that we do on the tenets and the guidelines of how we're guided from our mission statement of building a diverse and talented student body. So when we think about inclusion and our outreach efforts, we try to build uh, a, as diverse a group of that 9,000 as we can. And then we do our selections. Now, it is often uh, sort of a thought, or, or um, people think the way we do admissions is we take that 9,000 and we order them from 1 to 9,000 and then we just pick the first 1,500 on that list. And in fact, it doesn't work that way. And there are two reasons why it doesn't work that way. The first is that ordering students would presume a level of prediction accuracy that we just don't have. Um, it's really hard. When we're, we're admitting students on the prediction that they are going to be outstanding students here and beyond, to be able to order them one over another uh, presumes that we can do that with an accuracy that just doesn't exist. The second, of course, the second reason is something I've already mentioned. We don't have a single definition of what merit is. So consider this as an example. Imagine we had three applicants, Pat, Jamie, and Sam, and you can see their qualities. How would you order them? Uh, you really couldn't. I actually did this once with a faculty group and uh, asked students. I, I, I told the group, if you could admit only one student out of this group, which one would you admit? And all of the math faculty picked Pat. <laughs> the engineering faculty picked Jamie. And all of the parents and everybody else <laughs> picked Sam. And the reality is, we don't order them. We admit all of them. So we don't only admit Pat's or Jamie's or Sam's, but we admit all of them. And that's how we're able to assemble our class of 1,100 in a given year. Um, I want to talk for a moment about, uh, in, in conclusion here, uh, just around how we think about bias in our own decision making, because what, what goes on behind the closed door in the committee room. So a couple of very brief comments around uh, how we try to remove bias from our decision making. First of all, we do very extensive training with our readers, those who are evaluating the application, so that they know the rubrics and the guidelines that we're looking for when we're trying to admit students. So very extensive training. Every application goes through multiple reviews, and including faculty involved in the process. Um, but multiple reviews, and students are admitted by committee, not by any individual. And the committees that we use, we use multiple committees. So any student that makes it all the way through into ultimately being given an offer of admission has made it through several committees with different makeups. Um, so there's no, so even if there is some bias in one committee, uh, multiple committees might balance out those biases. The third, the, the, the third thing is we get feedback. So we are continually bringing feedback into our process around the outcomes of the decisions that we make. And the final thing I'm going to say is I've just volunteered Emilio and Denise to come and talk with our admission staff to make sure, they don't know this yet, but uh, I've done that, 
um, to make sure that we can uh, possibly continue to improve the work that we do. So with that, I will pause, and off we go into questions. Thank you so much to our three panelists for very fascinating presentations. So I'm going to start with a brief question for each of our three panelists, and then we will open it up to the floor for open Q&A. So I have a quick question for each of the panelists, and because we do want to leave time for audience Q&A, I will ask for brief responses from each of you, please. And I will go in the order of the presentation. So Emilio, it is very interesting to hear about what you have called this paradox of meritocracy. It's really unexpected. According to your research findings, is this paradox more likely to exist in any particular type of organization? And um, furthermore, I'd like to know what are challenges behind the implementation of meritocracy in the workplace? And what do you recommend organizations and leaders do to really ensure that meritocracy functions well inside their organizations. So I've already violated my own principle of keeping it brief. <laughs> if you would prefer to only focus on the second part of the question, that would be fine. All right. And how many minutes do I have to answer these three questions? <laughs> um, so I think um, I'm just going to respond the question that I want to you respond. Want to yeah. Why not? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, if you don't mind, if we can go back to my slides, right? I think, I think that you're actually raising an important question, which is now that we know about these challenges, what, what can organizations do to remediate some of these unconscious biases, right? So part of my current research agenda, um, I think, is aimed at answering some of the questions that you have, right? So one of them, and I'm going to try to click on this just to show you that I do belong to MIT. Right? So I continue, I continue exploring this idea of whether merit-based practices can actually solve rather than introducing bias in organizations. So one of the things that I wanted to do is some of these organizations where I found this, the paradox of meritocracy is what can they do in order to solve this problem, right? So I'm doing currently a study where I talk to top management in this organization and uh, we started talking about what kind of solutions uh, that could be applied in order to solve the problem. And now we're in the process of studying the after, right, once they introduce some of these organizational processes. So just in a kind of very quickly, just to tell you that the conversation I had with these uh, organizations have to do with introducing organizational processes that increase accountability and responsibility uh, on the part of the organization, and also that introduce transparency in these processes do tend to alleviate these kind of biases that we observe, right? So these are really principles that are really broad, but imagine that organizations that adopt, that actually empower committees to pay attention to diversity and to inequality inside of the organizations, and they monitor these kind of things over time, and when they identify problems, they start to come up with solutions to avoid this problem, can be a solution, right? Some organizations um, appoint C, uh, uh, officers that are in charge of diversity and inclusion, or appoint task forces that that's their own function. That seems to be a way of ensuring that these meritocratic efforts end up resulting in the results we want to accomplish. Also very related to your question about what kind of organizations, there's always the issue of generalizability. To what extent things that we find in one particular organization may be happening in places like MIT, like other type of uh, uh, small organizations. And here is where I'm actually involved currently in an effort to collect data for multiple organizations. And I'm trying to really collect detailed data about the type of merit-based programs that they have. And I'm trying to really understand how they're designed, how they're being implemented, in order to see whether there is variation in the way some of these outcomes are being achieved over time. And finally, one of the things that I'm actually excited about too, that I think that, that everybody has been touching on this, is also like an ethnographic study where we're actually trying to understand what managers mean when they talk about merit in the workplace. Because as, you, as we've established here, we all have very different 
conceptions about what merit is, and we tend to apply those conceptions when we're actually making our decisions, and there's a risk, obviously, if we don't do so. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you yeah. for your question. Thank so you my takeaway from that really is that it's not enough to embrace an ideal of meritocracy. We really need what you said, uh, accountability, transparency. Very important. So thank you for reminding that. Denise, what factors do you think increase the likelihood that an individual will be concerned about what you have called favoritism threat? Which I have to admit, I really had a personal uh, recognition when you talked about that concept. So thank you. Uh, thanks for the questions. Um, so I think that it's an important question because I have not experienced that in every situation that I've been in. I don't think it happens all of the time. One factor that I think was obvious from the talk is being a member of a character of a group whose characteristic is not valued in that particular context, right? So that you are different but you're different in a way that makes it not as clear that you fit or that you will perform. So if you're a woman in a male-dominated engineering group, then it would be more likely that these concerns would occur to you. Um, and particularly when you're evaluating another female candidate, because that candidate as well maybe casts some doubt on whether they should be part of the group, it emphasizes the idea that, well, if you're supporting her, it must be because it, you know, you're playing favorites. Because on their own merit, they probably wouldn't be able to be part of the group. And I did a, one study that really uh, tried to test this a bit. I looked at, uh, I put male and female students in a position where they were part of a group that were going to evaluate high school students for a college scholarship opportunity. And I had them um, essentially be part of a group where either they were the only one of their gender or they were in the majority. So I was the only woman out of six people or there were six, you know, five women and one guy. And I gave them equally matched male and female candidates to evaluate. And then I looked at how they evaluated them before they got into the meeting, right? So when anticipating that they were going into the meeting, and my thought was, that women, who were the only one, would show this tendency to rate the male candidate higher than the female candidate, in part because of these concerns, but that I wouldn't necessarily see that with the male participants because they were not feeling that they weren't valued in that context, right? So that even when I'm presented with these two individuals, even if I'm the only guy that's going to be in this group, I'm not necessarily feeling threatened in the same way. And I did see that the only condition where the two candidates were evaluated unequally was by women who were in the minority. So I think that's another important, an important element of you know, why does that matter is because it talk, speaks to what we can do to help alleviate the problem, right? One way that we can help alleviate this problem is by really emphasizing the value that each individual brings to our institution. Because if I feel that I'm a valued member of the group and I feel that people are not looking at this candidate in some negative way, then I'm less likely to feel this threat. Thank you very much, Denise. It's really, very enlightening. Uh, I think it also helps to put a label on this to, call, to understand that there is a phenomenon out there called favoritism threat. And then we can heighten our awareness of whether we are participating in that. So my final question is for Stuart. Uh, you mentioned that your, um, we all know, in fact, that your um, organization expends a lot of resources to do outreach to students who would otherwise be underrepresented in our applicant pool. Could you share with us what some of the most successful strategies for that outreach have been? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's actually, it's an interesting question. We have 19,000 applications uh, our class size is a little over a thousand. You, you might even wonder why do we do any outreach? Because certainly uh, we're pretty well known. And so most of what we do is focused on groups that are uh, are underrepresented. And um, the um, there are achievement gaps in the K through 12 system here, uh, both uh, achievement and also there's information gaps. So there are many many uh, very very high achieving students out there across the country. Uh, who just either uh, are not getting guidance 
uh, an understanding about what their talents are and what the possibilities and opportunities are for them. So really what we do is uh, we do a lot of communicating uh, with trying to, first of all, identify who these students are who might fit into that center category of 9,000 and do a lot of communicating with them. And beyond just communicating outreach, we try to bring them to our campus. So we, we do fly-in programs where we will bring uh, talented students who we think are, would, would fit into that, that group. Um, I think it might, it is also true that um, we uh, benefit from much work that is done at MIT and elsewhere, but at MIT in other offices. And I think of places like um, the Edgerton Center, the um, Office of Engineering Outreach Programs that do a lot of work with K through 12 students, uh, and there are others out there as well, but uh, to try to help build the pipeline and build awareness for students uh, who might not otherwise think of MIT. Well, may I thank you for the great work that you're doing? Because I personally know that we have some students who weren't even sure they were going to apply for college, let alone imagined that they would apply for MIT. And they have been some of the most incredible students I've been honored to teach. So thank you for the hard work you've been doing. So I'll open the floor to questions. I'd like to open the floor to questions now. And there are two microphones here. We'll ask people to come down to the microphone and queue up, please. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to let you know that in case people cannot get to the microphones, please raise your hand. And we have assistants here who will bring the microphone to you. So uh, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. So we'll start um, here first. <clears throat> um, Camilo, so your experiments are very eye-opening. And in your final experiment, you discussed that reinforcing meritocracy can paradoxically increase bias. And my question is, what was the decision process that went through to say less salary increase in female interprets as increase in bias and possibility of counteracted implicit bias where we automatically think that female getting less salary is directly correlated with increase in bias. I'm going to go to my slides. Because okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, pre I'm prepared for that question. <laughs> um, so, so part of the reasons for why we went into the experiment had to do with the idea that some of these managers didn't know the employees at all. They didn't have any other information about them that could complement their decision making, right? A little bit actually how admissions happens, right? You see the application, you see the performance evaluation, right? And I think your question has to do with what's happening in the non-meritocratic uh, part of the condition, right? That was actually addressed in a different experiment where we try to, one of the things that we were surprised about is why even in the non-meritocratic condition we actually find that the effect is the opposite, right? Um, that actually the participants were favoring women, uh, equally performing women in comparison with, uh, with men. And uh, one of the things that we had to do was just to get to a study three. And I have a lot of the details are actually in the study that I would be happy to send you uh, if, if you want to read more of the details of this. But basically, one of the things that we found is that in the non-meritocratic condition, we were putting a lot of emphasis on the discretion of the manager, of the person who knows what, how he or she should be distributing the rewards. Once we eliminated that kind of discretion in the wording of, of the non-meritocratic condition, you can see that that effect disappeared, right? So some of the arguments that we're actually making is that by emphasizing also discretion in the process, some of the participants were trying to overcompensate what they believe is the right is, is what's been wrong in the past when it's making decisions, and they were trying to overcompensate women uh, in comparison with men. In terms of the mechanisms that, um, and I think it's related to your second question, in terms of the mechanisms that we believe are accounting for some of these of these biases, um, I think they're very. You know, I told you more like at the organizational level, but I think that also there is a, there are studies in social psychology that actually will uh, help us support our hypothesis, this paradox of meritocracy that has to do with some of the things that you were asking for. So we know in social psychology that biases are automatic, right? 
that we automatically have biases. And it's all about whether we are motivated to avoid biases or whether we're actually put some cognitive efforts in avoiding being a stereotypical, right? And there's been like a series of, uh, of authors that I'm actually citing in the paper that you should, you, you're probably sure you're, you're aware of. And one of the arguments that we're making in this paper is that by, remo by emphasizing meritocracy, and this is a very subtle manipulation, it's just emphasizing the values of meritocracy, right? That what we do is we actually um, help decision makers to feel more confident that they actually are unbiased. And therefore, they're less motivated to be very careful in when they make their decisions, and they also spend less effort in appearing as, as stereotypical as well. Um, obviously, this is, like, this is the part of where, where I'm going now in terms of fathering some of the findings of this experiment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a question over here. Hi, uh, my name is Phyllis Barajas, and I'm the founder and executive director of Conexión, which is an executive mentoring and leadership program for mid-career Latino professionals. And I'm proud to say we've been affiliated with MIT Office of Human Resources since our inception in 2005. And we came about in response to a lot of the work that you're doing. We found that many, many Latino mid-careers, people with 10 years or more into their career, when we looked at these successful achievement-oriented Latinos, are very invisible in their organizations for a whole variety of reasons. Some of what we've learned anecdotally was things like they felt it may not be to their benefit to admit if they could pass. In my case, I'm Latina, Chicana, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, people say, everybody in Omaha looks like me, right? Uh, uh, yeah. so, uh, so we found that many of them questioned whether it was even in their best interest to own that they were, in the case of our community, Latino, or if they were like me and it was obvious that you were other, you were ethnic, uh, how to work around that, how to, the whole question of assimilation adaptation. And I'm gonna get to my question in a second. Um, <laughs> I've been assistant dean at the Kennedy School at Harvard. I was the first Latino at that level at the Kennedy School and probably at Harvard while I was there in so the maybe, early could 90s. Could you get to your um, yeah. question first? Because we do have other okay. people waiting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The reason I mention that is I want to ask you questions about what's the behavior of that change agent? You circled that woman in the picture. I'd like you to talk a little bit about what's the role, what's the courage that we need to take those risks to be the ones to influence the environment. Because believe me, I've been in that seat. I was a deputy assistant secretary as well. Uh, but what do we do? Because it's a lonely place to be. You've got to take a lot of risk with your career. And it, God help you if you screw up. Thank you for uh, sharing your perspective and, and for your question. I think you hit on the word in your response, which is courage. Uh, and what my hope is that by making some structural changes, we can make that process feel less threatening and require less courage to, to actually play this advocacy role. Um, I say to people, I, don't, I would not at all say that individuals who are in that position don't help those who are similar to them, right? Or that even if they have concerns about this role or how they're going to appear, that that means that they necessarily uh, evaluate the other candidate in a negative way. But I do argue that based on the responses from that you know, simple survey that I conducted, that many people who are aware of and concerned about these things are taking action in spite of these concerns, in spite of the cost that they think it may come to themselves, to their career, to their legitimacy in the organization, and to their ability to to make an impact. So um, some anecdotal stories that I have been told as I've talked to people about this work are, for example, if we have a pool of candidates, if we're fortunate enough to have a pool of candidates that includes multiple individuals who are similar to me, let's say there are three African-American candidates, then I clearly can't advocate for all of them, but I can advocate for you know, one or two. right? And so these are some, some of the decisions that individuals make to do this, but even that is a, a courageous step. So I think 
talking about it, awareness of it, acknowledging it, and you know, my advice to people is to step up in spite of the threat, sort of get over it in a way. I mean, that's, that's easier said than done. Uh, but that if, if we recognize that restraining ourselves may actually further negatively impact these candidates, then I think we do have some responsibility <coughs> to try to overcome our fears and act. So unfortunately, we're running quite low on time. So maybe I could ask people to ask a very brief question. And maybe we can take two questions before going to answers. So I see people here. OK, so I'll try to make this fast. Um, I went to um, Haverford College. It's a small liberal arts school in Pennsylvania. It's about 10% un underrepresented minorities, 90% Caucasian. When I walked into the school, like we had 10 weeks of intense trainings around, intense discussions around diversity, around class, around um, sexuality and those sorts of topics. So I've been here at MIT for about 12 years or so. MIT is actually the most diverse place that- Can we ask you again to get to the question Yeah, so part, it's the most we'll diverse to place I've ever seen, but I'm that. not sure that the level, I don't know if there are those sorts of conversations, like for such a diverse place with people coming from so many different backgrounds, I'm not sure if the student population is engaging in, in conversations around race, class, uh, sexuality, those sorts of conversations. So I'm just curious if someone can sort of address how students are sort of um, taught to, you know, taught to sort of begin these conversations across lines of difference. Great, thanks for the question. So we'll take one more quick question. Doug Jones from MIT uh, Lincoln Lab. I really appreciated seeing the, in the outcomes at the individual level, salary level, and that kind of thing. And I was wondering if you could give a pointer to influence on organizations, perhaps, um, you know, whether there's a team of people because of the diversity have uh, more, uh, an increased profit margin, better sales, more patents, anything like that. Just I, the empirical side of the diversity question, do you look at the organizations and the influence of diversity on that? I'd appreciate any pointers. Great, thanks again for another great question. We'll allow one last question to be asked and then open things to the panel, please. I would like to raise a question about the definition of diversity. We have indicated that diversity is in skills, is in gender, in race, in religion, and so on. We have not talked very much about diversity in income for our, particularly our MIT applicants. And I know that there is a good deal of outreach going on. I wonder what further outreach activities might be in order. MIT is a instrument for bringing people into better conditions of life and giving them opportunities. The pool of low-income people is increasing all the time. And A, we are losing potential capable people, and B, we are not fully fulfilling our obligation to provide equal opportunity for careers to all members of our community. So my, my comment is, how much further can we go into recruiting lower income students, and what role does the EDX kind of program have to play in the future in making opportunities available to lower income people? Thank, Thank you. you, I think that's a really important question. Stuart, we have one minute left. Yep. Could you give us the okay. short? <laughs> Here it is, here's the answer. Double my budget. Um, uh, just, to, just, we should be very proud of the of the work that we do do. Per, yes, uh, there's always more uh, that more outreach that we can do, bringing talented students to MIT. We should be proud of the fact that 20% of our undergraduate student body receive Pell grants. 
which is a very high uh, proportion compared to uh, other like kinds of institutions. Uh, and our financial aid program, which is uh, our admissions decisions are need blind, and we give out need ba uh, uh, aid based on need to everyone. We give out a lot of financial aid, um, and we should be very, very proud of what we do without saying that, yes, perhaps there's more that we can do. Great. Thank you, Stuart. Now let me turn things back to our president for a wrap-up. Thank you. Well, thank you, Emma. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that that clock is counting 14, 13, 12, so I don't have much time to say, to say much. But I want to say that I was delighted to be here, and I was really uh, 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 it, it was an honor for me to be in this panel. The presentations were terrific. I learned quite a, I learned quite a deal this morning. I took some notes. So let me just say thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Emilio and Denise and Stu. Those were great presentations. Thank you to Emma for moderating. I, I, I'm delighted you didn't ask me any questions because I don't qualify as an expert in that group, so I, I, I was very grateful for that. Uh, and, uh, and I thank you all for, for being here. Uh, I learned a great deal. I hope we all did, and we have lots to learn this morning and the rest of the day. So thank you all. Thank you, the panelists. <laughs>